Yeah, I was just calling about my savings account because I just got my interest payment and it looks like you're paying me nothing. Wait, so what are you paying me again? Wait, did you say point? Zero, zero, one percent. So you're telling me if I had a million dollars, you still wouldn't pay me any more than what you're paying me? Wait, did, did you just hang up on me? They just hung up on me. Are you tired of your bank paying you nothing? I'm out, man. That nigga's tripping. Interest rates continue to be at historic lows, which is great if you want to refinance your mortgage or buy a home for the first time. But when it comes to your bank account, your savings, and how much interest you're earning, it's a sad, sad story. Every time I log into my bank account, I think my bank has made some sort of mistake. Like, is that the right amount of interest that they were supposed to pay me? Like, there has to be a typo. Like, is this a human error? For example, one of the savings accounts that we have with our bank has just over $300,000 in it. We get paid our interest monthly, and when I got the last monthly interest payment, I'm like, is that it? No, God! So the interest payment on this account that has over $300,000 in it, the interest payment was $2.84. $2.84, like that's it, are you serious? So if you are fed up and you're ready to not take it anymore from your bank, I got nine different options that are gonna pay you a whole lot more than whatever your bank is paying. And you're gonna find out what those options are right now. What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to the channel, Wealth Hacker Labs. I'm your grateful host, Jeff Rose, and it's time to make your life more, and we're gonna make your life more by getting you more in your savings account. So right now, the national average savings account rate is 0.06%. Now, what's even more sad is that my bank is paying less. That's right, my bank is paying 0.01%. Now, we can sit here all day and complain, or we can do something about it, and that's what we're doing today. We are doing something about it. Now, each of the nine options that I list in this video, I start from the most conservative to the most aggressive. So with any of these, make sure that you understand the risk involved. Also, if you're interested in trying out any of the platforms that I mentioned, there'll be a link in the description. Now with some of these, I am an affiliate, so I do get paid a small referral fee if you do try it out. Now, most of these I have tried and tested out myself, and I would not suggest something if I didn't think it was a good fit. But at the end of the day, you got to know yourself. You got to know your financial goals and what are you most comfortable with. And it never hurts to get a second opinion by talking to a financial expert that can help you understand what you need to do. Without further ado, let's take a look at number one. So number one is a Neo bank. Now, anytime I hear the word Neo, I think of, you know, the matrix. So what exactly is a Neo bank? A Neo bank is basically just a digital bank. And most of us, like that's what we're used to. I mean, we use our phones, we use our computers to access all of our bank accounts. But with a Neo bank, there is no brick and mortar location. So you cannot get in your car and drive to a Neo bank. Now, most Neo banks, they have arrangements where you can get access to an ATM so you can pull your money out. And unlike traditional banks, Neo banks don't offer loans. You can't go and get a personal loan. You can't go get a mortgage. They're just dealing with your savings accounts or dealing with your checking accounts, debit cards, et cetera. Now, chances are you've probably heard of a Neo bank or familiar with Neo banks. You just didn't know it was defined as a Neo bank. Now, right now there's over 247 Neo banks that exist in the world. And Neo banks aren't going anywhere anytime soon. In 2021, they had 11.4% penetration into the market. That's expected to grow to just under 14% in 2022, with almost 20% projected up until 2025. So what makes Neo banks so attractive? Why would you want to choose a Neo bank over the bank that you're already with? Well, if you are a 100% digital bank, that means you don't have to have buildings. You don't have to have real estate which also means that your overhead is very low. So that means that you can afford to pay out more. One example of a Neo bank is Chime. So why would you wanna choose Chime over the bank that you're currently with? Well, I'll, I'll give you a reason, 0.5%. So right now Chime is paying a half percent on their savings account. And if your bank is only paying 0.06% or less, at a minimum, that's eight times more than what you are getting. And they're not the only one that's paying more than what your bank is. Another option is Lending Club. Now I've talked about Lending Club before in the past, but for different reasons. 
Lending Club was known to be more of a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. They made a huge pivot a couple years ago, and right now they are striving to be the largest neo bank in existence. So right now they have a special promotion. I don't know if it's a special promotion, but you can get a high yield savings account through Lending Club and they'll pay you 0.6%, which is yeah higher than what Chime is paying. Now, one word of caution with Neo Banks: make sure that they do have FDIC insurance. You all know what that is, but there are some Neo Banks that don't have this. Now, the ones I mentioned, they all do, and they do this because they partner with larger banks to get that FDIC deposit insurance. But you could do a quick scan of their site. Chances are, if it's a company that you've heard of, like a Chime or a Lending Club, you're going to be okay. But if you start choosing some <laughs> Neo Bank that you've never heard of, yeah, just be careful. All right, number two is for all you inflation freaks out there that think hyperinflation is just around the corner. Number two is tips. So tips are treasury inflated protected securities. These are issued by the government. You can buy these online at treasurydirect.gov. How tips work is that they are tied to the CPI or the Consumer Price Index. Economics 101, the CPI basically tracks what is the price of goods and services that are being paid for. Are prices going up? Are they going down? So in theory, if inflation starts to go up, you'll see the CPI go up, and then in turn, you'll see what tips are paying also go up. So that yield should increase. Now, the cool thing with tips is the tax features. If you buy a tip, you don't have to pay state or local tax. You're still on the hook for federal tax. If you wanna buy them, they start off at $100 and they increase at $100 increments. If you want to see what the current interest rate or the current yield is on tips, you can head on over to treasurydirect.gov, select the column marked tips, you'll scroll through, you'll see the yield, you'll see the different terms, and then you can find out how much you make if you bought a tip. If you want to know what the current interest rate or the current yield is on tips, head on over to treasurydirect.gov. You'll go there, you'll see the different columns, just select tips and it'll show you the yield that is currently paying as well as the different terms. So with number three, it's going to be a surprise to many because typically when you think of number three, you think of meme stocks like AMC or GameStop. So number three is online investment apps. And one of those is Robinhood. So with Robinhood, yes, they offer no free or free stocks, no commissions, all that stuff. What they also offer is a cash management platform. And with their cash management platform, it is basically like a neo bank. You can open up an account, a savings account. You can get a debit card and you can start purchasing things. They have access to ATMs all over the country, 75,000 ATM access. And guess what? They're paying 0.3%. Now 0.3%, that's not a huge amount, but it is more than the national average. And also it's a perfect bridge to one of the later options. But Robinhood isn't the only online investment app that offers some sort of cash management banking product. Another option is M1 Finance. Now I've talked about M1 Finance quite a bit. You can check out some of the other videos where I talk about their investment pies because that's pretty much what they're more known for but they also have a different product called M1 Spend. And it operates just like Robinhood, or very similar, I should say. Now with M1 Finance though, they have their generic basic introduction platform. As you can see here, if you do that one, they pay you nothing. I mean, they actually, literally, they pay you nothing, like 0%. But they also offer what's called their M1 Plus program. With M1 Plus, you can see here it's paying 1% on their savings account. They also have a cashback debit card, which will pay you 1%. So that's good. Now, if there is any catch with this, there is a fee. So they will charge you $125 a year to have access to this account. And maybe this sounds absurd to pay $125 a year to have a bank account. So does it really make sense? Well, you just have to do the math because if you have a lot in your savings account, like we do, you know, making 1% as opposed to making 0.01%, but paying that $125 per year, like I can do the math pretty quickly and see that it would make sense for us, at least financially, 
to do the M1 Plus platform, pay that $125 and net the difference. Robinhood, M1 Finance, they're not the only investment apps or online investment brokerages that have a good yield on their savings account. But I will say that there are plenty that are paying just like the brick and mortar banks. So make sure that you know exactly how much they are paying if you're trying to benefit or take advantage of a high yield. All right, on to number four. And number four, we're talking about buying somebody's junk. We're not talking about that kind of junk. The junk that we're talking about is junk bonds or otherwise known as high yield bonds. If you didn't know this about bonds, all bonds have to get what's called a rating, very similar to like your report card. Now, I don't know how your report card looked when you were in school, but we're not gonna talk about mine. Investment grade bonds are your good students. These are the ones that are triple A rated down to single A. Anything that is below investment grade, so we're talking triple B plus or worse, these are your high yield bonds. Just like other bonds, you can buy high yield bonds individually. But to keep it simple, and because I know that you don't want to do a ton of research trying to pick the right bond, I'm gonna show you a few different options that you can buy a basket or a pool of different high yield bonds. One of the first ways that you can do this is through a mutual fund. And there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of different examples of high yield bond fund mutual funds. The first one I want to highlight here is the American Century High Income Fund. So the symbol on this is NPHIX. And you can do a quick search on this fund. You can find the expense ratio. You can find the year to date return, the year to date or the return over the inception of this mutual fund. What I want to highlight here is what is it paying? You know, what's its not dividend yield, but what's the yield on the mutual fund? And here it's 5.12%. This is just the first example. Let me show you another one of a high yield bond fund. The second mutual fund I want to show you is the Nuveen High Yield Municipal Bond Fund. Same thing here. You can check all the returns, the expense ratios. What I want to point out once again is what is the yield? Here it's 4.68%. Now, the cool thing about the high yield municipal bond fund is that these are all muni bonds. So there could be some tax advantage, whether you're not having to pay federal tax, maybe state tax or local. Definitely check with your tax advisor to see if you can benefit from this. But here is just another example of getting much higher than the bank is paying by buying municipal bonds. Now, if there is a knock on mutual funds, it's that they cost a lot more. The expenses, the internal expenses, or the expense ratio that you saw on the screen previously, they're much higher than ETFs. Now, the other disadvantage is that a lot of the online investment platforms that we talked about on this channel and also in this video, like Robinhood and M1 Finance, they don't offer mutual funds. So you're not going to be able to buy those two funds that I just mentioned. So if you still want to buy high yield bonds, but you can't get it through a mutual fund, there is still another way. And that's through buying an ETF. Just like the mutual funds, I want to give you two examples of high yield bond ETFs that you can buy. The first one I want to share with you, I, I just love the symbol. The symbol is JNK. And if you haven't figured that out yet, that is the abbreviation for junk or junk bonds. Now this is the Spider Bloomberg high yield bond ETF. And this basically is buying high yield corporate bonds. And you can scroll down, you can get the yield on this thing. It's paying 4.36%. I'm sorry, no, it's a little bit higher than that. The current yield is 5.52%. So that's one example of a high yield bond ETF. That is traditionally corporate bonds, but I also want to give you a municipal bond high yield ETF. And this is the other one that you can look at. This is the Van Eck high yield muni etf with a very easy to remember symbol of hyd and we can talk about the taxable equivalent yield we talk about how if you're buying muni bonds there may be some sort of you know tax advantage by doing so so if you look at the yield on this van eck high yield bond etf the 12 month yield is 3.56 percent and depending on what tax bracket you are in it could be much more. So if you are in the 35 35% tax bracket, 35% uh, would be 3.77%. And this, once again, all depends on what is the tax rate? What state do you live in? 
and there's any other tax write-offs that you may have that could affect your overall yield. Moving on to number five, we are staying in this realm of high yield, but instead of high yield bonds, we're now looking at high yield stocks. And just like high yield bonds, typically when you hear high yield stocks, you think of stocks that are taking on more risk or the way that they are structured, kind of like an MLP, a mastered limited partnership, you know, they have to pay out a certain dividend. Now, some of these high yield stocks have more risk than other dividend paying stocks. But what I want to talk about in the scope of this video are the dividend aristocrats. The dividend aristocrats is this distinguished list of 65 different companies. Now this list gets updated every quarter. So right now there are 65 that could change. So what does it take to be a part of this distinguished list of dividend aristocrats? Well, the first thing is that they have to be a part of the S&P 500. So they are one of the 500 largest companies in the United States. So that is one. The other thing is that they have to have a record of paying 25 years worth of dividends. That's a big deal. But the other big deal is that not just that they are paying the dividend, but they also have to have increased that dividend over that 25 year period. And there's a few other things that you can look at. For example, the co companies must be worth at least $3 billion at the time of each quarterly S&P 500 rebalancing. So there's some other things to consider, but what you need to know for the sake of this video is that they have a history of paying dividends for a very long time and that dividend has continued to increase. So it's kind of like, okay, you're getting a paycheck and you're getting a raise. And if not, they get the boot. And for me, when I'm thinking of dividend aristocrats, I'm thinking of blue chip company. Now, I have not heard of every single company on this list, but I am sure many of you have heard of a lot of the different companies. And here, let me just give you a few so you can see the types of stocks that make this list and what is the dividend yield. So the first stock we'll look at is AT&T. Can you hear me now? Whoop wrong commercial my bad so at&t just to give an example it's on the dividend aristocrats it's been on it obviously for a number of years its current dividend yield is 7.88 percent now that is higher than typical of the dividend aristocrats so let me give you some others to kind of balance it out mcdonald's is another member of the dividend aristocrat list its dividend yield at the time of this recording is 2.2 percent now, this may go up, you know, if Elon Musk is actually going to eat his Happy Meal. That's what's going on at the time of this recording. But anyway, that's for another video. So anyway, McDonald's, 2.2% right now. Another example is Target. And this is a company and store that we, I don't frequent a lot, but my wife does. So we're definitely helping this company out. And we should. I mean, so I'm glad that I'm giving some of this money. I'm getting some of this money back in the form of a dividend. Not as much as we give them. But dividend yield on target is 1.68%. I know for me, if I'm looking for any types of stocks that are paying dividends, the dividend aristocrat list is the first list that I'm going to go to. Somebody's already screened all these. You know, these are all companies that have a very long history of paying dividends. So why wouldn't I start there? Or I guess I should say, why wouldn't you start there? I think that is a great place to start. All right, number six is for all of you out there that maybe you just can't make a decision. Like, gosh, Jeff, I like a little bit of that. I want a little bit of this. How do I just get a little bit of everything? A little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. So number six is a blended approach. So if you're one of those that you want a little bit of high yield stocks and you also want some high yield bonds, but you also want to keep some in that high yield savings account, it is the blended approach. This is the best approach for you. So if you've already set up a Robinhood account, an M1 finance account, that's what makes this transition so easy because you already got money in their high yield cash management programs. So now if you wanna start adding stocks, maybe some ETFs, you can do that as well. Now with Robinhood, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to actually <laughs> calculate, you know, how much or what percentage of this stock or ETF that you want to buy. If you want an easier way to do it, that's where M1 Finance, I think is going to be the best bet. There you can build the investment pies however you want to do it. And if you've not seen my other video on M1 Finance, my M1 Finance review, please do, because I break down all the different investment choices, how to build your own pie. That's a great video, a great resource for you. 
Now, another option you can look at is Betterment. Now with Betterment, they're a little bit different than M1 Finance. They have their own portfolios. They only have ETFs. So if you're trying to build a custom portfolio and you want certain ETFs or you want individual stocks, then Betterment is not the best choice. But with Betterment, all you have to do is pick what is your investment goal? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? And after you go through all these different questions of trying to figure that out, then they, Betterment, will build a custom ETF portfolio for you. So really, really simple. You just got to tell them what are you trying to do? And they're going to tell you what you need to do. Whereas with M1 Finance, you, you, you got to figure out what you, what you want to do. And then you have to build it yourself. Now, if you want to keep adding on to this blended approach, another option, number seven is real estate or real estate investment trust. And there, once again, are a lot of different choices that you can look at. There's two that I want to share in this video. The first REIT option I want to show you is an ETF, and this is the Vanguard ETF. So the Vanguard Real Estate ETF symbol is VNQ. And if you pull up the symbol, you can look at the return, how it's done. And you can see this 10 year return is 11 and a half percent since inception is just under 10, 9.8%. So this is a solid option if you want to add real estate. Now with real estate, the way they pay this is a little bit different than your high yield bonds or your high yield stocks. So just keep that in mind. Another option you can look at with real estate or real estate investment trust is Fundrise. And Fundrise is one, once again, I've talked about Fundrise on this channel. You can check out my other videos where I talk about Fundrise. So Fundrise is a privately owned real estate investment trust. Now with my Fundrise portfolio, I've been with Fundrise, I think over three years. I'm actually gonna show you my return that I've made on my Fundrise account. So going back to 2018 is when I started this. So you can see in 2018, 7.5%, 9.2, 7.6, Last year, 2021 was a, that was a good year, 23.9%. So my all time rate of return right now with Fundrise is 13, where'd that go? <laughs> there it went, 13.1% is how much I've made with Fundrise. Now is Fundrise better than the Vanguard ETF? I'll, I'll let you decide. I just liked, what I liked about Fundrise was the ability to see what am I actually putting my money into? Like, I just love looking at the portfolio. They show you the different properties that that I am I am buying, that I'm putting my money into. You see all the different uh, pro projects they're working on, ones that they have acquired, ones that they are selling. And it's just this type of transparency that you typically don't see in a real estate investment trust. So anyway, that's why I like Fundrise. If you want to check out more on Fundrise, I'll have a link to the other video and also a blog post where we talk about the pros and cons of investing with Fundrise. All right, moving on to number eight, and this is a new addition to the list. Actually, I stumbled upon this one when I was doing research for this video. So number eight is short-term notes. And that is so vague, so generic, but let me explain. So I'm familiar with the platform Yield Street. I was not familiar that this was a product that they offered. They offer what they call their short-term notes. Now you can see it's paying a very nice yield, 4%. So 4% and how these notes work is that they are issued every six months. And basically the gist is that they're trying to get you to give them money so that you'll be more comfortable investing into other investment offerings that they do. Now, what, what does Yield Street offer? So they are this alternative investment offering, which once again, sounds really, really generic, but let me just give an example of one of their, I guess their core investment, which is this Yield Street prism fund and you can see like what they're actually investing into so this is invested into 29 percent into real estate we also have consumer financing legal finance marine art cash commercial corporates and they even kind of break down exactly like what they're trying to shoot for what like the art is uh the different types of commercial actually i was reading one of these yeah so check this out the investment is partially funded in a five million dollar term loan secured by a first lien on all the assets of a company leasing mainly luxury and exotic vehicles with an expected maturity of 30 months. Dear Lord, that is a mouthful. But you can see like, this is the type of investments that you and I typically don't get access to. 
So Yield Street was their goal was to create an investment platform that allows the normal investor, the average investor to get access what usually only the wealthy, the wealthy get access to. Now, if there is one catch to this, and this is a pretty big one, if you are trying to open up an account with Yield Street, you have to verify that you are, here it is, a little disclaimer here, an accredited investor. So what exactly is an accredited investor? You've got two different requirements. Either you have to have at least a million dollar net worth, or you're making $200,000 a year if you're single or $300,000 if you are married. So those are some pretty tall numbers. So maybe this isn't a good option. If not, that's okay. We've got seven other good ones. Actually, we've got eight because I got one more right now. I feel like if you're already a subscriber to the channel, like you already know what number nine is going to be. And while we're talking about that, if you are here and you're not a subscriber, I mean, go ahead and knock that out. So number nine, it by far is the riskiest of all the different options, like for sure. Uh, but I'm, it's the one I'm most excited about. And it's also the one that I have the most money in out of all the different ones that I have mentioned. And number nine, without further ado, is crypto savings accounts. So technically they're not crypto savings accounts, but you can definitely use it like that. And there's several options. We're gonna talk about two real quick. So the first option is a BlockFi. Now I mentioned BlockFi because this is the one that I started with. This was my introduction into crypto savings accounts. So basically all you're doing with a crypto savings account is you're opening up an account at a crypto exchange, just like the crypto version of an E-Trade or a TD Ameritrade. And then you don't have to buy Bitcoin, you can, but you buy what's called a stable coin. And there's a few different options, but the option I'll talk about here with BlockFi is USDC. And I went ahead and put this number in so that you could see like how much you would make. So right now, if you were to put $1,000 in into BlockFi and you put it into USDC, which is a stable coin tied directly, or not directly tied, but it is tied to the US dollar, you can see after a year, you would have made $89.90 of interest, which is a yield of 8.9%. Now that's what I was most excited about. Like that's what I wanted. That's why I opened my BlockFi account initially was to take advantage of this yield. Now from there, I have moved a lot of that stable coin into Bitcoin and Ethereum to take advantage of not only the yield, but also the price appreciation. Now, I still have money with BlockFi, but recently uh, a good friend of mine turned me on to another crypto exchange that I am, I don't know if I'm even more, yeah, I'll say I am even more excited about. And this is Celsius or Celsius Network. Very, very similar, but there are some subtle, if not really big changes. And the reason I went more towards Celsius or going more towards Celsius is the yield that they're paying, not just on USDC, but also with Bitcoin and Ethereum. So, you know, here's an example. If you wanted, if you had some Bitcoin, if you want to buy Bitcoin, they'll also pay you a yield on your Bitcoin. So if you had $3,000, actually, let's just do one year. That way you get an idea. So if you had $3,000 of Bitcoin, and you held it for a year, and we're assuming here that Bitcoin did not go up or down in value, you would have made $192 of interest on your Bitcoin. So this is kind of like getting a dividend on your Bitcoin. But for many of you out there, maybe Bitcoin is not what we're talking about alternative banking options. That's a little bit more on the higher risk side. So let's look at one of the other stable coins. Actually, we'll just look at this uh, USDC. So you got, let's do $1,000 just to make it the same. So $1,000 USDC, one year, there you see it, $89 of interest, 8.5%, very similar to BlockFi, but there is one big difference, which I absolutely love. There are some other things that I'll share in future videos, but what I love about Celsius is that they don't pay you monthly, they pay you weekly. And I get a weekly email from Celsius that shows how much interest they have paid me. I tell you what, my bank doesn't do that because they don't want to know or they don't want me to know like how much they're not paying me on my savings account. But a company like Celsius that is, you know, doing the whole 
crypto stable coin thing, you know, they want you to know and they want you to get excited and you should get excited. If you're comfortable with crypto, you know, this is not any suggestion taking any of your emergency fund money. I'm not talking about taking any money that you wouldn't be comfortable losing because there, there is that potential. You know, all this crypto, there is no guarantees. There is no FDIC insurance. So I would say if you are interested, tread cautiously. You know, I first started with yeah, the BlockFi account. I only put in 25 grand. And from there, it, it grew a lot as far as like how much more I added because I just got more comfortable putting money in. But you have to know what your comfort level is. You don't want to get too greedy. It can happen. It's happened to me. It's going to happen to you. So just make sure that you are comfortable and confident. All right, y'all, so that is the nine different options that you have that are gonna pay you a lot more than what your bank is paying. Obviously, if you're making eight and a half percent with a BlockFi or a Celsius, I mean, that is out, out of the park compared to the 0.06% you might be making or the 0.01% that I'm making right now. That's why I continue to move more money that way. All right, y'all, hope you enjoyed this video. Until next time, this is Jeff reminding you that it's your money, it's your life, and only you can make it awesome. Until then, peace.